So hi, the few people who are here. So we're going to talk about packing strabismus today. So what is packing strabismus? It is the presence of a significant difference in the size of the horizontal strabismic deviation in defined positions of upgaze and downgaze. So basically, it is nothing but vertical incompetence in horizontal strabismus, right? So when we look in upgaze, the angle is going to be something else. When we look in the downgaze, the angle is going to be something else. And when we look in the primary position, the angle is going to be something else. But uh, so we've seen that it in about one in about five patients who has squint, uh, there is prevalence of A or B patterns with it. So about 12.5 to 50 percent of the cases of squint have some sort of pattern associated with it. It may be a complete pattern. It may be an incomplete pattern, but there is usually a pattern associated with squints. So what are the, uh, how do we classify patterns? We have the V pattern, which is the most common type of pattern. And how do we define it when there is difference between the upward and the downward uh, gaze horizontal deviation, the difference is greater than 15 prism diopters. Or we have an A pattern when the difference between up gaze and down gaze horizontal strabismus is 10 prism diopters. Other sort of patterns that we have are lambda, y, and x pattern strabismus. <clears throat> So we're going to quickly go over through why this pattern strabismus occurs. Yes. No, that is that is in the position of gaze, how to measure. I'm going to come to that as well. So you'll, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. So why do these pattern things occur? So there may be the most commonly accepted school of thought is oblique school dysfunction. So when there is an apparent inferior oblique muscle overaction, we have V patterns. And when there is an apparent superior oblique muscle overaction, we have A patterns. Why does this happen? We all know that inferior <laughs> obliques are elevators and extortors and abductors, right? So when our inferior oblique is overacting, the eye is going to abduct, right? So you don't know eyes, when they abduct, they're going to go this way. So when they go this way, so if there is esotropia in the primary position, there's going to be less esotropia here, more esotropia here. So inferior oblique overaction associated with esotropia is going to have like a V pattern esotropia, right? Or if there is an exotropia, right? So there's exotropia here, there's inferior oblique overaction, so there is more exotropia here and less exotropia here. So then these kind of kids, when they come to your OPD, they're going to have some characteristic head postures as well, right? Because they're going to go they're going to keep their eyes in that position of gaze wherein they fuse maximally or their squint is minimal. So in children who have V ESOs are going to be like this chin downs because in the up gaze, their ESO is minimal. And likewise, in V exos, the kids are going to keep their heads like this because in down gaze, their exo is minimal. Right? Getting the point? Then there's another school of thought known as the horizontal school of thought, wherein if you do get a pattern, but you don't get any oblique uh, muscle overaction associated with it. So they say that it's probably due to some horizontal <clears throat> muscle dysfunction. So they say that if there is overaction of the medial rectus on down gaze, that is going to lead to a V pattern isotropia. And then likewise, you can do all the permutations and combinations. However, this school of thought is not really accepted. So we usually go by the oblique school of thought. There is another vertical school of thought as well, which we do not really follow much. OK, so we've seen that these pattern strabismus, they are most commonly associated. They are very commonly associated with children who have other uh, sort of orbital dystopias. For example, children with craniosynostiosis, they usually present with A patterns or children with anti-mongoloid or mongoloid slant or palpebral fissure anomalies, they also present with pattern strabismus. Why is that? There are two different theories for it. For the first theory is that there is an, there's a visual axis angle. And the uh, this is known as the sagittalization of the visual, uh, the oblique muscle theory, in which they say that when the, the angle between the visual axis and the, in, the angle between the insertion of the inferior oblique or the superior oblique, it is increased in shallow orbits in cases like Crouzon syndrome and other craniosynostosis. This reduces the abducting abilities of the obliques. That leads to pattern strabismus. Also, in cases of these orbital dystopias, where we have X-cyclotorsion of the orbital bones, these lead to X-cyclotorsion of the globes as well. 
and therefore our MR and our lateral rectus insertions are slightly displaced superiorly for the medial rectus, inferiorly for the lateral rectus. Hence, when they are acting, a normalist action leads to patent strabismus. So this is like a common diagrammatic representation of how an A pattern isotropia and exotropia looks like, which I just explained to you. This makes, I think, things a little bit more clearer. Uh, this, is, these are, this is the diagrammatic representation of B pattern exotropia and isotropia, which again, I don't think there's much to really look at here. So these are real-time pictures, thanks to MS Ma'am. I got these pictures. Few of the pictures are mine, few are taken from MS Ma'am. So this is a V pattern exo. As we can see here in the down gaze, I look, they look almost nicely aligned. Yeah. So this child, he has a V pattern exo in which we can see that there is an exotropia, there's a left exotropia in the primary position, which is really clearly increasing in the up gaze. Although he's alternating freely, so we can see in the up gaze there is actually a right exotropia. And in the down gaze, he looks pretty much ortho. Not really ortho, but it's quite better here. So this is how an E pattern, B pattern exo looks like. This is another child who has a B pattern exo. So the exo in the up gaze really, really increased. This is a B pattern ESO wherein it's the opposite. We see in the down gaze, the ESO is really a lot. Do you see that in the left eye? the eye is almost completely isotropic. However, when you, she looks in the up gaze, eyes are comparatively better. This is an X pattern wherein uh, there is exo deviations, large exo deviations, both in the up gaze and the down gaze. Lambda patterns never really come, come across them clinically, but uh, you can make a sense out of it, wherein uh, the deviation in the primary gaze and the up gaze remains same and it increases in the down gaze. Y patterns, again, the opposite of lambda, wherein the deviation in the primary and the down gaze remains the same and it increases in the up gaze. Okay, so most commonly, uh, the things that you need to remember for your exam associations of pattern strabismus are craniofacial anomalies like craniosynostosis, spina bifida, mostly associated with A pattern strabismus. And the mechanism for that, we already discussed the orbital dystopia mechanism and the sagittalization of the oblique axis mechanism. Other associations are anti-mongoloid lid fissures. So when you have an anti-mongoloid lid fissure, it leads to an A exo or a V exo. So this is something that you just need to remember. An A exo pattern, an A pattern exotropia is associated with an anti-mongoloid fissure. And then you have mongoloid lid fissures, which are usually associated with the opposite, A pattern exos. Infantile esotropia is very, very, very commonly associated with B pattern esotropias. So every time you have a child who has infantile ET, so there are going to be two, three really characteristic features to it. Large angle esotropia with usually one eye preferring for fixation, the other eye usually being sort of amblyopic. There may be an associated DBD with it. And the most commonly associated pattern is B pattern. So this is very commonly asked in your DNB vivas. Okay, so now a patient has come into you. How are you going to establish a diagnosis? First of all, you start observing the patient as soon as he walks into your room because these kids have characteristic head postures like we just discussed initially. A sensory evaluation is a must, must for these patients because they may be controlling the squints well in cases of intermittent XTs or ETs uh, while you are examining them. But uh, sensory evaluation really gives us a clue as to how the control has been of the clinic. Especially in patients who have pattern strabismus, they may have good stereopsis value for near, despite the fact that the parents keep complaining, nai, 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 squint is a lot at home, squint is a lot at home. But when he comes to the clinic, you see good stereoacuity. So these patients characteristically have good stereoacuity for near. They have good stereoacuity in their abnormal head position. But however, in the forced primary position, these guys don't have good distance visual acuity. So we don't usually do routinely distance stereoacuity. That is why we don't really come across them in our clinical practice. But this is something which you ideally should be doing. Stereoacuity for distance and near both separately. Assessment of vision again is important because you want to know that the squint is freely uh, alternating before you plan on any surgical correction for them. Motor evaluation again is important. How do you evaluate? You do versions first. And then if you feel that some version, there is some limitation of movement during the versions, then you uh, occlude one eye and then you go in for ductions. Especially when do you want to do this? Especially when, when do you want to check for ductions? Especially in infantile ETs because you may have some pseudo limitation of abduction in those kind of babies, right? So you may, when, when you ask the child to move, you may actually see that the eye is not moving fully. 
Why? Because these babies generally cross fixate, their abduction may be limited. So you want to actually occlude one eye and see if the other eye is moving fully because you want to differentiate these from bilateral six nerve palsies as well. And then during the motor evaluation, obviously we measure the angles too. And then a cycloplegic refraction and a fundus examination is necessary for all patients coming to our OPD. So you observe as soon as the patient starts entering, you look for any gross align misalignment at distance. And then you look for AHPs like I discussed and any facial asymmetry or anomalies like we already discussed again. And you always look at general physical appearance for any syndromic association of these babies. Sensory testing and vision assessment, I think I've already gone through it because uh, we, we know the only good point, the an important point to note here is that you may in children uh, who are very visually active and attentive, they may have and uh, they may have a sliding abnormal retinal correspondence when changing from up gaze to down gaze because these kids, if they are very visually attentive, they may develop an abnormally retinal uh, an abnormal retinal correspondence in this case compared to the primary gaze compared to the down gaze as well. So they actually see well from all three gazes. So this is something that we need to note. Okay, so this is what you were asking. How do we check how, so I, when I say you have to measure in up gaze and measure in down gaze and the difference between up gaze and down gaze should be 15 prisms for ESO, for XO or for B pattern, sorry, and 10 degrees for 10 prisms for A patterns. What do I mean? How, what do you mean by up gaze? Up gaze meaning that you lift, you want to keep the eyes in 25 degrees in the up gaze. So how do you get that? You do it like this, right? So you, you depress your chin only as much as you can get the eyes in 25 degrees up gaze position, right? And the down gaze position, you're going to be taking, you're going to uplift the chin in such a way that you get your eyes at 35 degrees down gaze, okay? So this 25 and 35 is the position of the head that you need to keep while you measure. But actual difference between the measurement should be 15 and 10 for V and A patterns respectively. Okay. Okay. So this is how you measure your, uh, uh, this is how you record your measurements. It should be done in all nine, nine cardinal positions of gaze. We usually do it on only about six. So one primary gaze, lever version, dextro version, up gaze, down gaze, and then two tilts, left and right head tilt, always, and uh, also for near. For near, always use an accommodative target, never use light and other things. However, Krimsky tests and other things can be performed in very small and uncooperative children. So uh, then you also have to, while you're uh, doing your ductions and versions, you have to look for inferior oblique overaction or superior oblique overaction and underaction. So this is, inferior oblique overaction is most commonly associated, so we grade it as well, plus one, plus two, plus three, and plus four. So this is a diagrammatic representation, the one that you see in the middle. So the A part is showing plus one inferior oblique overaction in the right eye. The B one, can you see that the right eye is slightly more elevated and abducted compared to the other eye? So that is about plus two overaction. The C figure, can you see it is more abducted and more elevated compared to the other eye? So that is plus three. And the D one is plus four. So arbitrarily, some books give uh, a method to classify as in plus four, meaning that the diff uh, the 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 difference in the deviation of the two eyes is about 90 degrees. Like if you draw a line through the visual axis of the eye which has the inferior oblique overaction, and if you draw a line through the through the pupillary axis of the other eye, so if you draw a line during the between the first eye and the second eye in the first A figure, it's about 15 degrees. So about 15 degrees meaning plus one. In the second figure, if you see, it's about 30 degrees. 30 degrees is about plus 2, 45 degrees, 40 to 45 to 60 is about plus 3, and about 90 is about plus 4. Superior oblique overaction is seen in down cases. Uh, we classify it similarly. Okay, torsion. This is a very, very, very important thing that you should look for in all cases where you suspect pattern strabismus because torsion can, uh, yeah. So how do you do, uh, the, there are a couple of ways of measuring torsion. So either you can measure torsion objective, subjectively by performing a double medox rod test. How do we perform a double medox rod test? Okay, so we're gonna ask the patient, we're gonna put, uh, make him wear a trial frame, we're gonna put two medox rods like that. If you orient the medox rod horizontally, he's gonna be seeing vertical things. If you orient them vertically, he's gonna be seeing horizontally things. Okay, so we're gonna orient them horizontally so that he sees two vertical lines. And then vice versa, you can do it, okay? And then you show him a torch light. So he's going to be seeing two lines. Right? So if you have, if you place the medox rod horizontally, you're going to be seeing two lines like this vertically, right? But if there is torsion, 
So the patient will see one line straight and the other line he's going to be seeing tilted. Okay. So then you, you, when you initially place your medox rod in the trial frame, you place it on 180 axis. And then he's going to be like, nay, nay, one is theta, one is theta. So you're going to slowly and slowly keep turning the medox rod in such a way that he complain. Now he says that, yes, this has become straight. Okay. Because once you turn the medox rod in a certain way, the image is going to actually turn in a certain way in his own eye. So when the image becomes parallel, when the lines become parallel to each other is the amount of torsion in that eye. So you can document it. So for example, if you align the axis on 180 and rotating it, rotating it, you get it on 170. And that is when he says that, yes, he's able to see two parallel lines. So he has about 10 degrees. And then you see whether you're rotating it clockwise or anti-clockwise and in which eye it becomes that much degree of intorsion or extorsion. Okay. And uh, the more a uh, very easy way of documenting fundus uh, documenting torsion is looking at fundus torsion. So you have torsion of macula. How do you how do you really see whether there is whether there is torsion of macula or not? So we see here four figures. So the easiest way to see is that when you look at figure A over here. So you see two lines. One line is going through the center of the optic disc, right? The second line, the theta wala line, that is actually going through the center of the macula or the center of the fovea. So when these two lines, when they meet, this is the angle. This is a DFA angle. But anyway, we're not going to go disc foveal angle. This is known as a disc foveal angle. So when you actually move the line that goes from the center of the macula, when you make it straight, you will see that that line should cross the Interior border of okay, so this is what a normal funder should look like. Okay, but if if you feel that this line is below, if, if the macula, if the fundus is intorted, the macula is going to be below the disc orientation, as in figure C. The disc is going to be slightly elevated or a little higher compared to the fovea. So the line, if you draw a line, an imaginary line through the center of the fovea, it's not going to lie on the inferior disc margin, but it's actually going to lie below it, all right? And vice versa. If the line through the center of the macula or the center of the fovea goes through the upper disc margin or above the center of the disc, probably distortion of the macula. So now coming to surgery. Uh, usually, what are the general considerations that we have for surgery? Always check for muscle, oblique muscle dysfunction. If if it is present, then we perform a surgery on the oblique muscles. If there is no oblique muscle dysfunction, then we just do supra placement or infra placement of the recessed or the resected horizontal recti. But it is definitely better to <coughs> identify the overacting muscle and weaken it than to strengthen the underacting muscle. So when you have V pattern, it's the most common type and it is most frequently associated with infantile esotropia and intermittent exotropias. If you have oblique muscle dysfunction, that is if you have inferior oblique overaction, then you just, what do you do? You do an inferior oblique weakening procedure. What are the inferior oblique weakening procedures? You have inferior oblique recession. You usually do a 10 millimeter recession for inferior oblique. Other procedures are inferior oblique anterior transposition and all those things, but usually we are doing inferior oblique recession itself. If you do not find any oblique dysfunction, but you do see a pattern, then what you can do is you can do vertical transposition of the horizontal muscles. So usually when you're transposing the horizontal muscles, you do only about half a tendon shift. So for example, this is the initial, this is your muscle. So for example, this is my muscle and this is my, uh, this is my original insertion. This is how my lateral rectus or this is how my medial rectus is. Okay. So if, if I want to do a guy, if I want to do medial rectus recession, I'm going to cut this muscle off from here and I'm going to push it and place it back a little back from the original insertion, right? So ideally, if this is my insertion side, I place it back ekdam idhar. So this border correlates with this border, this border correlates with this border. But when I say I'm going to do an upshift or a downshift, what I'm actually going to do is place it half tendon width over your half tendon width below. How do I do it then? Then instead of doing this, I do it from the center of the recession, uh, from the center of the original insertion. And then I mark another point over here. And then I do it like this. Okay, so this is an upshift, and if I do it like this, this becomes a downshift. So always remember that medial rectus goes towards the apex of the A or V. Medial rectus goes towards the apex of the A or V. So for example, if it's a V pattern esotropia, so when you're doing medial rectus recession, you're going to do a downshift of the medial rectus recessed muscles. So half a tendon downshift. So for example, if this is my medial rectus, and this is how my muscle is. 
when I'm going to recess it, I'm going to recess it and I'm going to place it half a tendon bit downwards. Okay. And vice versa for V pattern exotropias. V ke andar, the lateral, uh, lateral rectus always goes towards the base of the ARV. Medial rectus always goes towards the apex of the ARV. You have to remember just this. So this is that same boy who had a V pattern exotropia. We performed a uh, bilateral lateral, uh, lateral rectus recession with only upshifting of the recti. And here we can see he's nicely aligned. If you see this photograph, the amount of exotropia in the up gaze is much more. And uh, now he's nicely aligned in all three cases. So it's very, uh, very, very important to notice if you've broken the pattern on the first post-operative day or not. This is again our child who had a V-isotropia. So we did a bimedial recession for her and we did the downshift of the recti. So here we can see nicely the eyes are aligned in the down gaze, in the primary gaze and in the up gaze. However, pre-operatively eyes were more isotropic in the down gaze, less isotropic in the up gaze. So this is post-op two years, she's doing well. So that was surgery for V patterns. Now we have A patterns. This is the second most common type. These kind of kids usually present with some difficulty in reading. Then again, if you have oblique muscle dysfunction, if you have superior oblique muscle overacting, then you just do a PTSO. You do a superior oblique posterior tenotomy in which you cut off the 7 8 of the superior oblique fibers. You just leave the anterior 1 8 because those are the torsional fibers. If you cut them, the patient is going to have torsion and it's, the diplopia is going to be very, very disturbing to the patient. So you only cut the 7 8th anterior fibers of the superior oblique. And if you do not have oblique muscle dysfunction, then again, you just do vertical upshift or downshift with the horizontal recti. Here again, you do the same thing. Medial rectus always goes towards the apex. Lateral rectus always goes towards the base, right? In X pattern, exotropias, we know that the exotropias are way high in the up gaze and the down gaze. So you don't really do much for them. You just do very large bilateral lateral rectus recessions. You do large recessions for them. So this is a this is that same lady, and uh, she's doing well post operatively. So sometimes when we have amblyopic eyes, what do we do for them? We don't like you know one eye is six sixty, the other eye is nicely six six, and then you see some pattern happening in those eyes as well. But then as a rule, we usually as not as a rule, but as by convention, we usually, when we have one amblyopic eye, and that is strabismic because of the amblyopia, we don't like to operate on the normal eye, right? So in amblyopic eyes who have inferior oblique overaction or superior oblique uh, overaction, we can do a unilateral recess resect and not really touch the oblique muscle, but just do horizontal upshift or downshift of the recti. That is equally effective. Or when you do when you're doing a vertical upshift or downshift for the horizontal recti, it causes it treats about seven degrees of torsion. So if you are having a lot of torsion, if you have greater than seven degrees of torsion in a fundus, then you have to go in for an oblique procedure. But if you have little torsion, about six seven degrees or very minor torsion, you can go in for uh, slanting of the slant recessions of uh, vertical uh, horizontal recti. Okay, so there are very few complications, but uh, rare and uh, not, not a lot of them. But uh, the first one, most common one is diplopia. This usually happens if we are correcting pattern strabismus in little older children, possibly older than 12, because in those kind of kids, the fusion has already developed. So they may have diplopia, post-operative diplopias. But if you are doing surgery in like younger kids where the visual system is still immature and other things, they usually are very, very plastic. Their visual system is very plastic. They're just to the surgeries very well and they seldom complain of diplopia. Anterior segment ischemia, of course it happens if you are uh, operating on more than three recti muscles. That is why we always prefer to operate on obliques in addition to two recti because they do not contribute to our uh, anterior segment circulation. And uh, sometimes a very, very rare complication may be an emerging overaction of the other oblique muscles. For example, if we are recessing our inferior obliques, we may have some superior oblique overaction, some maybe say 10 years later or something. It has been documented, but it's not as frequent. And uh, sometimes we may have some post-operative head postures if we have done some asymmetric weakening of the inferior oblique or of the obliques, basically. Why? Because they may produce some effect of torsion because obliques are also totters, right? So if you've done 10 millimeter recession in one eye and only eight millimeters in the other eye, but they had equal <clears throat> amount of overaction, that can lead to a torsion and then that can lead to an opposite head tilt. I think that's about it for today. Thanks.